What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archive at madnessradio.net. Hi, everyone. This is Will with Madness Radio. And today's show, we are interviewing Michael Generelli, who is a longtime organizer with the Icarus Project, which is a peer run community mental health um, network and website and um, movement, Mad Pride movement. And he is also um, organizer with the Misled Youth Network, and they run a community space, 123 Community Space, which is a radical community center, has volunteer-run um, art, a book for prisoners program, screen printing, um, bike workshops, and an after-school program, and that's in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. And he also works with Fountain House, which is a mental health clubhouse in uh, New York City. So it's great to have you on the show, Michael Generelli. Thanks for thanks for coming today. Yeah, totally. It's uh, great to be on the on the Madness Radio program. Um, yeah, so glad to be here. Maybe we can start out with your own sort of when madness kind of started affecting your life, or extreme states of consciousness, or mental health diagnosis, or whatever you um, whatever you want to call it. And you mentioned that it was as childhood. It was really early for you, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess it goes, yeah, it does go back to about, um, it actually goes back to between the ages of five and, um, and eight. Uh, I was, uh, I have a story that unfortunately is all too common. I uh, was an abused child between those, in just those three years. Uh, I had a stepfather that, you know, physically, emotionally, verbally, and sexually abused me, like, oh, almost oh. every day. Mm. Um, and so that was pretty rough. And after after he split, after, after we finally got away from him, rather, you know, I was, um, you know, I mean, that, that takes a toll. That, you know, that's, that kind of stuff is going to take a toll on a, on a young mind. And um, I had a lot of emotional issues. And so many of the people who, um, you know, I've met and myself who have different kinds of mental health problems or struggle with madness do have some kind of abuse that, that goes back to early childhood. And it's just not talked about enough. So I really, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and talking about that. Now, you were living in, in New York. You grew up in New York. Um, actually, at this time, at the time this happened, I was actually um, in Oklahoma. I moved around a lot as a young child. I lived, my, my mom is from New York City, is from Brooklyn, and we lived there for a time. We lived in Staten Island for a time. Then, because my dad was, my parents had met in the Air Force, and he was from like, they were from, his family's from like Oklahoma and Kansas. We were out there for a time, and that's where my stepfather came into play. So and, between um, five and eight, you had a lot of problems with abuse with him and that's yeah. really when you're started struggling with madness or the the effects the issues that 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 created for you yeah yeah and so um so all the moving aside we ended up in ohio um when we uh, when we split from uh from my stepfather and um it was there that <clears throat> i was put in we were we, we were like really poor and my mom was on welfare. We ended up in the projects, and um, I ended up being referred to this program called the Child Guidance Center. And um, it was, you know, basically just a, a like a state-run or state or city-run program, like mental health program for poor kids. So what what kinds of things were going on for you that what led you to be referred to this program? Were you depressed or anxious, or what kinds of things were you struggling with? Yeah, um, even at that age, I dealt with. Um, it played out really in like, um, like outbursts, like, um, like I would get really, really angry, and like lash out, and and like you know, have these like fits of rage where I would scream and and hit stuff and throw stuff, and and then I would be really um, withdrawn and um really depressed and 
um, I don't think at age eight I I hadn't yet been thinking about suicide, but um, it was n- not long after. I think it, by the age of twelve I was like, you know, running around like running into like closets and and running into my room and wrapping cords around my neck and threatening to strangle myself while my mom would be beating on the door screaming to you know open the door yeah it really sounds like this is kind of trauma reactions to the abuse that you that you went through at such a young age from the the stepfather and so and so yeah so that that's what uh, got got me placed in the, in this program and then but then this program was like you know it was it was just really up in like every way possible it was um psychi- uncaring psychiatrists it was a processing plant for like children and for like psychiatrists to like i often talk when i talk about it i talk about being mentally raped because you know the way they would like just poke and prod our brains and and and, and psychoanalyze us like you know just way too much like constantly analyzing us all the time and then even as I got older I started to be tested on medication I was one of the people I was one of the kids that was involved in the um you can read about this in the DSM how Depakote was a um originally an anticonvulsant and around about 1992 they started doing clinical trials on its effects for um, bipolar mood disorder and I was a part of that, and I was 12 years old. So there was a really authoritarian program in a lot of ways, it sounds Definitely. like. What were some of Definitely. the things that they, that they did that were such a problem? Do you remember stories from that, them or from, from that period, or what, what kinds of things happened? Well, I mean, just like, uh, you know, having to go there every day after school. Um, just, and again, just being like, you know, just very coldly and unfeeling, and a very unfeeling unfeeling way of being psychoanalyzed and, you know, asked, you know, about everything and, and in just a very, like, again, a very authoritarian way instead of, like, a, a more, like, caring way. Because, like I said, it was, it was like a processing plant. It's like a factory. And um, they just, yeah, and the, the, the medications and stuff, I mean, like, um, kids would be on, like, suicide watch. I remember, you know, kids, I remember one friend of mine being carried through the lobby by two large gentlemen who was kicking and screaming about how the, um, there were bugs all over him, and and um, they just carried him off into a back room, and I never saw him again. I mean, I'm sure nothing foul happened, you know, but, I mean, like... That was kind of like the way they did business. So there was a lot of force. They were putting kids in restraint and pinning them down yes. and stuff and forcing them to take drugs. And, God, it's really awful. W- what were some of the other kids like? Did you make connections with them? Were they kind of, was there any kind of sense of solidarity or support among the children that were there? Um, they really did their best to keep us um, separate and, like, keep us um, as in, like, individuals, like, but, like, you know, in the sense that not wanting us to associate with each other. But I did I did make several friends. The one friend that I spoke of um, that was carried off, and I never saw him again. Uh, his name was Tommy. And, um, uh, yeah, he was, um, yeah, I guess he kind of uh, had a lot of the same issues that I did. He had been abused, and... Um, it was just, um, yeah, and just several other friends. But I guess it's been so long, and I was so young. And I mean, I don't really know their stories. I can't speak on their stories. Do you think that that left long-term scars on you? I mean, did you feel like it really stigmatized you and separated you from other kids? And also, how old were you, and, and how long were you in this program for? Um, I started when I was eight years old, um, and I was taken out finally from the program uh, at 15. Wow, so seven years. And, and do you think that you really are suffering the long-term effects of that? Do you still have memories, and does it still affect affect your your self-conception, or do you have any kind of trauma symptoms from it? I do. In a lot of ways, I feel like you know I lost my childhood, a large part of my childhood. Um, 
that was just very different from from a lot of other people's, I don't know, I mean, everybody has different experiences, but I think going through something like that, I don't see how how any person couldn't feel that way. So from their perspective, they're trying to help you. Did any of this give any help to you, or was it just completely not effective at all? Or? I like to, I, I think about this one, there was one psychiatrist or psychologist in the program who seemed like, you know, he was different from other people. He really wanted to, like, try and, like, help the people, the kids, and he was, like, a really nice guy and a lot more thoughtful um, than anyone else. And he, I really made a, a connection with him. He was a, a nice guy, and I, I started with him um, in the program. I started to think, well, maybe there is something to to some of this. Maybe they are trying to help or maybe, you know, in the right way if it's done the right way maybe this can be uh positive but that was very short-lived and he was like moved out of the program or something like that and then it was back to back to the factory well so you formed a connection with him but then he was gone yeah so how did you get out of that place it sounds really really odd. you went there for well, seven years right because the 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 really kind of like the medications and stuff started at 12. And um, once my mom became like really educated about what was going on there and the medication issue and stuff, she wasn't cool with that. And so she finally, you know, pulled me out of the program, you know, when I really like broke down and told her like what was going on. And so I was pulled out of the program. But then, you know, I mean, even then it was like... So then having been in this program and then no longer on medications from the age of 15 to um, to the time I, I left home, that was also, you know, really rough. I still had these mood issues and uh, suicide attempts, anger um, issues. So it was, it was, you know, it still became really hard. When did you start writing? I know that you're a writer now, but were you ri writing as a child? Were you writing when you were in this program at all? Uh, yeah, I I've written, uh, started writing stories when I was like a little kid. Since I can remember, I've always uh, been a writer. It was a hobby a lot. Um, as a young kid, I was always told, because we were poor, I was always kind of like told, you know, you don't want to be a starving artist, you know. So I like, I, f I focused as a kid, I was big into science, and I was always good with math, and so I, I was, uh, you know, once upon a time I said I was going to be an astrophysicist and a biochemist and all that good stuff, and I was studying that, but quietly in my room for fun I would write little stories, a lot of times science fiction and, uh, you know, it's like supernatural spooky stories and stuff. Wow, what kinds of what kinds of things were they about? Science fiction. It's like, you mean, can you give can you remember one of the stories or an example of that? Or um, one of the stories that I wrote um, was uh, inspired by this short story that they often make you read in school. I think the name of it is "By the Waters of Babylon," and it's like a, a post-apocalyptic type story. That's what I used to write a lot. I used to write. Um, I, I've always been fascinated with. Uh, uh, you know, like post-apocalyptic times, like, you know, what, how the world will be in a future where things have been torn down, where civilization has had to restart. That might play into your activism today and how you're trying to create a new society and have these visions of social change. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've thought about that now, you know, as an older person. I look back on that and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so when you got out of this program, what... Um, what happened next? Were you able to get your life back together? It sounds like your mom was a little bit more uh, careful and more protective of you. Um, but um, how did things go for you when you got out of it? Well, um, you know, again, it's, it's you know, hey, I've had a rough time. And another tearjerker is that a year before I got out of the program, um, I met this incredible girl who, you know, became my my girlfriend and uh, we were just like made for each other and she loved me and I loved her and it was a whirlwind and it was incredible but she was also bipolar and 
so we were together. She struggled a lot, and but I was funny. I always thought that like she had her her stuff together more than I did. And um, so we were together 14, 15, 16, and 17. And that, you know, I still had troubles with home, you know, dealing with mood issues and stuff. But it was kind of, you know, it was manageable for the most part. And I had I had Lucy. And, um, yeah, uh, so then, but then at 17, she went through uh, some really rough... Uh, personal stuff in her life and ended up taking her own life and she actually died in my in my arms I made it to her room but a little bit too late and um, after that I kind of like totally shut down um, uh, and I ended up in in the hospital in a, a real like actual psych hospital for the next six months where I was pretty much catatonic. Wow, that's such a horrible that's such a horrible thing to hear. I'm so sorry that, that happened. That's God and such and your first love and really young and just how devastating it was. Um was so you say she was struggling with a lot of the same kinds of issues that you were. She had a bipolar diagnosis and was she dealing was she having family kind of struggles and problems as well and she had been in the same program right uh she was actually not in that program i didn't i didn't meet her in that program i met her just in school and um yeah she had uh, some family issues and personal stuff that had gone on with us and then her family getting involved and i kind of not prepared to go into that part of it but yeah she um yeah, she had a lot of the same issues, and I, I, I thought, I thought that she had it together more than I did, but I was, I was wrong. So you were really kind of grieving for her and the trauma of it, and then you end up in a, in a psych hospital. Is that that's really what they had to offer in terms of of helping you? Right, right. That was the only thing that that anybody could could think to do, which is unfortunate. Because you were totally shut down and, and catatonic and not communicating and not moving. and Right. And so you were in the hospital for about six months? Yeah. Yeah. And um, through, I mean, I don't know, I guess just time and, I mean, the doctors would probably say through medication, you came around. and uh, But uh, I don't know, I mean, I was on, they did, you know, put me on medication and um, and I just kind of, I think it was just time, basically, I just needed time, I, my mind had just been through so much, that I just needed to, like, kind of, like, regenerate, or, or something, like, and figure out what I was going to do next, and then, so, I'm, at this time, 18, I get out of the hospital, I, I kind of, like, uh, say okay I've got to like live for her if nothing else um so I uh I finished high school through this like you know like out of school program or whatever and then I just started working I didn't go straight to college I was I, I needed because you know poor family was poor and everything it was like couldn't really go straight to college, and um, they were like, you know, I had to start paying rent, you know, at you know at my mom at my mom's place and with my my new stepdad, who was a pretty cool guy, actually. But he was like this old school, you know, like, you know, you're 18, you got to get a job, you got to pay rent, you know. <laughs> so that's what I did. I started working, working, you know, like some different odd jobs. But then finally. Um, I realized that um, I got to, like, get on with my life and, like, you know, find a, a career and, and, and do something. And I was also still, like, you know, thinking about the plans that Lucy and I had had. And she was always, you know, into New York City and my mom being from New York City and my family, like, all the family that I cared about and knew being in, in either in New York City or upstate. I had always wanted to come back as well. So I ended up 
getting into a college in Akron, Ohio, which is where I was, and then transferring from there to St. John's University in Queens. So started doing that. If you're just tuning in, uh, this is Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall, and we are speaking with Michael uh, Generelli, who is a survivor of the mental health system and organizer with the Icarus Project, the Misled Youth Network, and works with Fountain House in New York City. So you ended up going to college in Akron, Ohio. How did that go? Um, that, that went actually, I mean, that went pretty good. I, I, um, I kind of was finding, a, finding myself and, a, and finding a balance with myself and getting into a routine and uh, was like, uh, became, uh, started doing, I was an English major, at, at the University of Akron I was an English major and journalism major, like double major, and so I started like uh, um, working with their literary magazine, I had become the managing editor um, of the literary magazine, um, I had started out as a like a uh, just a staff writer on the on their newspaper on the college newspaper and then um was asked to become the opinion editor um for them so I was doing that kind of stuff uh all that getting to know all about that kind of stuff and everything that goes into that so so I made my way back and transferred from the University of Akron to St. John's University in Queens and New York City being a much bigger city and a lot of stress and a lot of people, I can imagine that might have been a t- time when things started to change for you. Right, right. So so things, yeah, things had been balanced and were coming, you know, the, you know, they were okay. I still dealt with some things, but it, it didn't really get out of hand. And then I came to New York and started going to St. John's and... It was just like, so the picture of what happened before I ended up in, um, like, on the street or, like, well, in Bellevue and then on the street and then in Bellevue again was, um, you know, I was going to St. John's and I was doing much of the same stuff, but, like, you know, it's New York City, so, like, on, like, a more grand scale. So I was, like, um, managing editor for St. John's for their humor magazine. Then I became editor-in-chief. I was um, a a, a staff writer for the St. John's student newspaper. Um, I was, uh, I had been an intern for HarperCollins in in Manhattan, big publishing house. So I think that the DSM should actually list New York City as one of the the factors that can drive people into manic depression because it's just, it just, it just is, it is so huge and it can be so overwhelming and there can be such wild swings. Yeah. So like, so I was doing all these things and like, um, like I decided that the Harper Collins, um, like suit and tie editor was not my style. And I started, um, uh, then interning for, a smaller, very cool publishing house called Soft Skull Press, which is where I read a book called Peeps, which was written by this incredible artist by the name of Fly. And her and her, her and the stories of her friends inspired me. She inspired me to um, to change my life, or or not even necessarily to change my life, but to realize that if my life changes, that that's, like, okay, and there are many ways to live in this world. And so all these, but then all these stressful things um, going on, like, it it was pretty much the stress of everything that I was doing that um, that I, I basically, I just snapped. I don't know how else to explain it. I just kind of snapped. I was not on I was not on any medication and not doing anything in lieu of medication for my mental health, and I just yeah and I just snapped, um, and I ended up, um, like, yeah I had a psychotic break what they call what doctors will call a psychotic break, and ended up in Bellevue for three months. In that time. Um, St. John's, you know, they were, they had no idea or or were very insensitive about the whole situation. Long story short, while I was in the hospital, I 
lost all my my scholarship money and everything to go to St. John's. So I was basically like done. I couldn't go to St. John's. I was out of school. Also, the apartment that I had been renting was um like kind of like under the table type deal. So being gone for three months, I lost my place. So when I got out of Bellevue the first time there, um, I was uh, I was I was homeless. I was totally out there. I was in New York City on the street with nothing. So when you say you had this um, psychotic break or what would be called, you know, a psychosis by doctors, what kinds of things were you were you going through? Was it kind of like a a return of the catatonia, the withdrawal that you had talked about before, or was it more like wild energy and not being able to sleep and that kind of thing? Or at this time, it was more wild energy. It was not being able to sleep. It was um. Uh, it was also depression. It was summed up at the time in, I mean, well, summed up to some extent in two poems that I wrote at that time. And um, so I have them here in front of me. Yeah, please. Okay. So they're both untitled. And the first one is, I'll, I'll just untitled piece about madness at this at this time kaleidoscopes look at the lights burn your eyes it stretches the world landscapes of bright people in electric storefronts and the world is frozen and i in it and i see the color instead all greens and reds yellows and orange it illuminates the madness and quiets the mind-numbing clamor of catastrophe the wandering, the dragging, comes alive. I am empty, scattered the pieces of my mind, shattered like so many exploding bulbs that line littered streets, and I run unbalanced, each careening light exposing my paranoia, and I am unnerved as the hallucinations begin to take hold. Too much love, too much life, too much caring, too new, my sponge is too heavy, I can't let her, them, they see me like this. Can I never be comfortable but in the embrace of my own madness? Wow, I can really hear the uh, New York City in that. That's an amazing poem, very powerful. And that was, you wrote that before you went into Bellevue, or that was when you were in Bellevue, or? That was after the first time uh-huh. when I was on that, when I got out. Because I went straight from, like, you know, my apartment in St. John's and all this nice stuff, like, to having a break, basically, I guess, because of stress or something. And and then when I got out is when I was totally, like, out there, homeless, not in school, and that's when I wrote these. And you lost your scholarship, and you lost school and that support, and they right. just were completely not understanding or helpful or supportive. They didn't give any kind of break or time off no. or anything like that. Wow, and not so then, not surprisingly, you just kind of ended up back in the hospital. Yeah, and so, yeah, so, okay, so the the next one, one more that I wrote that talks about kind of, like, my, my state, what I was going through, okay. On buses racing, people racing, minds wandering, shattered to countless shards, the reflections fleeting, Amazing all the wondrous freaks that flock to land's end, the pieces of their own visions. It starts slow and moves fast. Keep telling yourself that. It starts slow and moves fast. Keep telling yourself that. It starts slow and moves past, past the reflection and into your cerebellum. You can't think. You can't see. You shake. You cry. You scream but cannot hear the sound. Try not to harm your body. Repetition, repetition will calm your mind. The twitches hint the an- the arrival and foreshadow the end. Can anyone hear me? Can anyone hear me? You can't explain to anyone what's happening. You apologize to them for cracking open your skull, exposing them to places in your mind where the light can't reach, where the shards pierce. Fight the shakes. Clench your fists. Freeze. Breathe. So when I hear the word Bellevue, and I think this is probably true of a lot of our listeners, I just, I kind of get scared just from the word. It's kind of a scary (laughs) association immediately. And you spent many months in Bellevue Hospital, psychiatric 
hospital. What was that? What was that like? Was it helpful at all? Was it kind of like a sanctuary at all? Or was it more of the same kind of abuse that you had experienced? Or, or what, what was it like? Holy sh- it was so traumatic. It was the, it was like that, the childhood stuff all over again. I mean, I'll tell you, like, it was, it was, it was people, it was orderlies with, like, fast food run mentality. I mean, it was people who are untrained to deal with people who are experiencing these things. It's insensitive people. It's people who, let's, two months before were working at Burger King. It's, it's, it's doctors that, like, patronize you, like, condescend to you, um, are totally thoughtless about what you're going through, don't really ask you anything because they know everything, right? That's how they approach it. Um, And it's also a a pretty rough place just um, internally, like, with other patients, though, because it is, like, pretty much the one psych hospital that when the cops pick people up on the street, who are, like, going through, you know, extreme mental states and maybe even, like, um, people who have done, like, violent things, they take them to Bellevue. So, like, an example, a story about this kind of thing is, like, my first night going up from CPEP or the Clinical Psychiatric Emergency Program. You go from, you go in there first and then you go up to uh, to the ward. My first night when I then they took me up to the ward, they wheeled me through the door and somebody was screaming because a, a, another patient in one of the rooms, they keep you in rooms and you sleep with like on a bed, on you have a bed and then there's like three or four other beds in a big room. And somebody had woken up in the middle of the night and started strangling someone in the bed next to him because he thought that he was like a demon trying to get him. And so, like, that was a whole drama that, that was my welcome to Bellevue, 18 North. Oh, that's, terif- that's terrifying. How old were you when, when this happened? Yeah, so I kind of skipped ahead a little bit, I guess, with that story. Because the first time, um, the first time I went in, that was actually not the, the case. Um, I didn't go to the, I didn't go to CPEP that time. It was kind of more subdued. And that time was like, you know, like, that three months was just, like, very kind of, uh, I don't know, I was very sedated and very quiet and everything, and I don't really remember so much about that time. So, so okay, so just to, like, clear it up, so I got out, was on the street, like, I when I got, when I was on the street is when I, like, actually started to kind of feel like I, I, I went back to fly, and, and, and I got in touch with her and told her my story briefly and, you know, how much I loved her and how she inspired me and and to think that I could actually do this, that I could be on the street and still make it and survive. And um, she put me in touch with um, some really cool people who were like, you know, this person is like... <laughs> a person who's still, like, a very close friend of mine to this day. Um, And we all met at this squat in the South Bronx. And I started getting involved in, 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 like, radical politics and and all that. But unfortunately, like, there were still some stressful things going on. Um, The cops burnt our squat. And we were, you know, everybody was, like, on the streets again. And... um, like I had lost, I had I had gotten a job actually at this time, and but then lost it, and so like lost the job, and um, and so you know I ended up back in Bellevue, and that's when this happened. But this time it was I was only there for a couple weeks because I was more knowledgeable. I had already been put in touch with Sasha De Brule and the Icarus Project, and had been made aware of it. And um, and so I was kind of like, I knew a little bit more about like, you know, being able to sign myself out or whatever. You kind of learned, learned how to work the system to not stay as long this time. Right. And was that when you wrote the poem that you read at the St. Mark's Church Speak Out? 
Exactly. That second time I was in, and I, I kind of like, I kind of was more like focused on like, I just knew more about my own mind at this time now and more about the mental health system, more importantly. And I was, so I was kind of like seeing things in a totally different light. I was paying attention to more things, was focusing on these things that are going on to the patients and to the, to the staff and the psychiatrists. And so, so yeah, coming out of that, I, uh, I wrote this. My nerves are splitting. My limbs are jerking. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scarred. I can't make eye contact. I, I just n n need help to talk to someone. She looks at me in the same manner I imagine the FDA over tainted meat, flagged and tagged. Can't see straight at this point. Empty your pockets, someone says in a new room. How'd I get here? I need all your belongings. We'll put them in a locker. At this point, you don't know how long it will be before you see them again. The lights, the walls, the people, all devoid of life, all mechanical, all meant to sedate. Why always the opposite effect? A nurse prods your past like those little kids that would play with wounded animals. Are you now or have you ever been suicidal? How many times? With what? Were you abused as a child? By who? How often? With what? Do you give fits of rage? Do you hurt others? Describe your cycles. How long do they last? Do you hear voices? Do you hallucinate? How long do they last? How did I get here? I'm schizoaffective with seizure disorder. I couldn't take school. Work is wearing me down. I've been homeless. I need more money. Just a little, then I can travel. I want to volunteer my time, not slave it away. Fuck the system. Let them pay me. Their system did this to me. How many times will how many people ask how many of the same questions? A man says he doesn't have freedom of religion because no one will accept him as God. A man rocks. A man spits. A woman announces, we shouldn't have to watch kids' shows. I'm an adult. She then returns to singing the Chia Pet song over and over while aimlessly wandering the hall, breaking only to mention she's here for six to eight weeks and when are the sandwiches? A young and fragile semi-catatonic Asian woman makes her way to the phone to speak to a husband she's not sure she has. Baby Huey hollers for his chicken and don't touch his bed. God wants my phone book. He needs a lawyer. Adivan, Adivan, Adivan will calm you, Michael. But wait, I can't forget about Sophie, the black, white, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican girl with 50 kids and twice as many husbands. And she's got quite an attitude for a 10-year-old, especially since she's 23. Alas, the ward would not be complete without the renegade, runaway, schizo elf, clad in tight red and green and a ring of tampons for a belt. They take yours away, along with shoelaces. She smiles and claps for every commercial. The Asian catatonic woman doesn't want any meds. I have rights. I have a right not to be medicated. They do it anyway. No feeling. We don't play that nonsense. She getting those meds. Strap her down. They hold her against her will. Her face. In it I see defeat. As the orderlies make subtle references to Vietnam era horror humor. And she is gone gone to a place in her head where no one can come for her. She must stay here for safety, and my heart breaks for all those minds permanently scorched by the sun. I stand on the other side of the glass, a lab rat not to be taken seriously. I speak, and people just look at me like I'm crazy, but they're the ones that aren't supposed to. The staffers operate on a fast food run mentality, only their product is the mental well-being of fragile individuals. I get ignored again, and I start to cry. I want to see my friends. They'll take care of me. I think about the sweetest, most intelligent, creative, outspoken, kind, caring, sensitive, anarchist punk girl I know. I smile. I cry. They say I'll be here up to eight weeks. I bang on the window behind which I'm encased, screaming for ketchup. They look at me like I'm crazy, so I start screaming for Nick and Gabby. Now everyone's attention is aroused. They strap me to the bed. I scream for ketchup. 
This time a nurse with a syringe says, What? No mustard? I smile and dream. Michael, that's such a powerful, powerful poem. Thank you for, for reading in it. People should know that Ketchup is the name of a friend who was very important to you, and, and Ketchup went on to be one of the founders of the Misled Youth Network. Is that right? Yes, yes. She she is the co-founder of the Misled Youth Network and um, now is um, involved. She's also involved, has been close to the Icarus Project and is um, has from time to time. She's an incredible artist, and she's done some uh, graphic art for the Icarus Project. Well, tell us about how you went from this very, very painful place in Bellevue and this horrible experience that you had to turning things around and really the work that you're doing today. And I know you're involved in a lot of different great projects. And tell us about that. Okay, so yeah, um, when I when I when I came, when I got out, um, you know, it was pretty much through. I mean, I, it really was. It was through the Icarus Project, and the friends that I had made that, like, helped me come through this and you know, helped me find myself again and, 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 and realize what I, like, the kind of direction that I wanted to go with my life and how I wanted to handle all the emotional extremes that go on inside me. Um... That's the Icarus, that was the Icarus Project, and having these really supportive friends, which is, like, so, so important and necessary and something that the Icarus Project talks a lot about. Um, so, yeah, it was, like, um, just being involved with the Icarus Project and then um, through them finding out about this place called Fountain House, which is a very large... Um, mental health support services organization. So um, being on the street and not having any kind of benefits, you know, they help you with a lot of the, like, practical things, like, so, like, getting getting benefits, um, getting a, a stable place to stay, um, you know, like that. So it was through the Icarus Project and Fountain House that I was able to kind of, you know, find myself again and, and figure out like a, a direction and um, and then so just staying involved with those um, with those organizations <coughs> um, is really you know what helped me and and getting involved with the uh, misled youth network and and uh, and this idea of being able to to um, work with young people who may also be experiencing a lot of these emotional, issues in their lives and and being able to reach them at a at a younger age and and you know possibly you know help them from going through a lot of the more extreme things that I that I have so that's kind of it's like inspirational now the misled youth network um was the organizing group for the 123 community space that you're involved with now right Yes, they're one of the groups. The one, two, three community space in Bed Stuy in Brooklyn is um, a space that um, uh, again is like a huge inspiration for me today. And it's it was started by four, uh, essentially four um, like radical organizations: the Misled Youth Network, the In Our Hearts Network. Um, New York City Anarchist Black Cross, which does political prisoner letter writing nights, and um, the Freegan Movement sponsors a bike workshop at the space as well. And um, so we all came together and got this space, and you know we're working with kids in the neighborhood and just folks in the neighborhood in general. And I we started an after school program, which I work which I work with. Um, kids from the ages of five to ten, which I is just so inspirational for me. That helps my mental health really. Actually, you would think little kids it might like frazzle you, but like there's something about that age that is just so magical, and you can really like have such an impact uh, on kids at that age. I think, and it's just uh, every time I'm there, it just raises my heart and my and my soul up like fifty fold. Michael, what kind of vision do you have for what would you like to see the mental health system become or what kind of changes would you like to see 
happen so that people can really get the help and support they, that they need? Ultimately, I'd, I'd like it to not be a system. Um, you know, I just think that, that just the way everything works is just so, like, everything is so, like, this, this process, this, like, you know, assembly line, factory kind of thing. People are cold and unfeeling, you know. People, people need to be treated with more love and compassion. It's like the bottom line, right? It sounds so simple, but it just doesn't happen and I don't know why people need um, people need love <laughs> it's like you know basic and I think that the system is just so devoid of that and yeah and just to not call it a system and, and people people need people need to be treated like people need options and, and like not to be forced into things and not to be talked down to and to be taken seriously and to be accepted for who they are and what they experience. Michael, we are about out of time. How can people get in touch with you? How can they get in touch with the Misled Youth Network and Fountain House and the Icarus Project and the 123 Community Space? Oh, well, it's pretty much all... Uh, uh, the best way, I guess, would be the web, the wonderful world of the web. Um... So the Icarus Project is um, uh, www.theicarusproject.net, and that's the the website. And then you can reach um, what I'm do, like involved with the so local support group, new NYC Icarus at gmail dot com. Um, Fountain House is um, uh, www.fountainhouse.org. And you can find out all about Fountain House and phone numbers. And um, I can also be reached there, um, 425 West 47th Street, New York, New York, between 9th and 10th Avenues. Um, and 123 Community Space, um, we are on the web. Um, it's Well, it's, it's 123communityspace.org, and that's the, the numbers, 123 and communityspace.org and um, and misled youth can be found at misled-youth.org Michael Generelli thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio and good luck with all your really important community organizing work alright thanks a lot and it was great to be here and share my story You've been listening to an interview with Michael Generelli. He is a longtime organizer with the Icarus Project, works with the Misled Youth Network, and also with Fountain House in New York City, and is one of the volunteers with the After School Program and other work that's going on at 123 Community Space in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. So thanks a lot for tuning in today on Madness Radio, and we'll see you next week. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help us get broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.